Hey guys, uh, I'll sit down in a second. I just want to, again, thanks for coming. As we continue to develop this Morad Center, we want it to be kind of the destination in the country for sports study, and groups like this are going to be important to us. So spread the word, continue to have these events where we can bring in sports industry leaders like Barry, um, and we're going to have them as we go. Timing, I realize, is not always great, but uh, for your schedule, but we'll continue to have these things. So I want to welcome Barry Hanrahan. The how many titles you got there? Assistant General, GM, <laughs> Assistant General Manager of the Philadelphia Flyers, who are going to be back to work soon. Um, so before I go on, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. And again, unless he unless this doesn't go well, maybe uh, he's going to be back here in two weeks, three weeks, <laughs> uh, as part of our annual symposium. That's going to be about agents. Uh, we're going to start spreading the word on the exact panels within a week or two. We're going to have a super agent panel with some of the top agents in the business, and we're going to have a team slash maybe union player panel, which Barry will be part of, talking about their interaction with agents. Um, I know that Aileen, her name is now DeGrosa, she just got married with the Eagles. She's going to be part of it Great. as well, and perhaps even someone from the Sixers. So um, keep that in mind, Friday morning, March 21st. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having and me. Again, it's a repeat performance for those who were lucky enough to see Barry last year. I thought we'd start with what's every on everyone's mind, or maybe it's already off your mind by last night. But uh, the Sochi Olympics ended, and we were just talking outside. Uh, we're biased. He's especially biased. But we think the moment of the Sochi Olympics, even though uh, it did result in gold, was the U.S.-Russia hockey game and how exciting that was. So I just think, can you, I just want to start maybe this way. Can you watch those Olympics, the hockey, as a fan? Or do you watch it, obviously, thinking about how it impacts you with the Flyers and more business-oriented? How, how are you watching those games? More or less, uh, from, from my perspective, a little bit of both. I mean, obviously, in hockey being my life in terms of growing up with the sport and now you know, being involved in a management position, enjoying watching, especially with my, my three boys. They enjoy, right. they play, so we watch together. So you get the fan part of it. So you enjoy the games. Obviously, you want to see the U.S. do well in tournaments like this. But at the same time, you also have a rooting interest for your own players. We have five players represented at the Olympic Games. So you're always keeping tabs on whether it was Sweet, um, Finland. Um, we had a player for the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Austria. Now, all those games weren't necessarily on TV. Right. But we could check in with social media. We could see how our guys were doing. So... It, it was good to follow with my boys, so I don't often get that chance with our games because I'm at every home game. Right. Uh, but this was a chance to be a spectator from from your living room and watch the games from that perspective. Five players. We had five players. Yeah, four of them are back. Actually, Kimo returned uh, late yesterday. He played in the um, actually played uh, against the U.S. on Saturday. He returned late yesterday, but gets a couple of days off before he has to get acclimated back to the NHL schedule. So we'll probably see him on Wednesday. Could be by tomorrow, but I anticipate him Wednesday. Now, I'm just thinking of my own team experience. You must have been holding your breath every minute for injury. Right? Well, that's the big <laughs> thing. And I think more so than previous tournaments like this, you've seen players get hurt. And right. some have been season-ending injuries. Uh, John Tavares with the Islanders from Team Canada. Henrik Zetterberg, the captain of Sweden. And captain of the Detroit Red Wings, same thing. Uh, he has back surgery. He's done a handful mm. of injuries uh, across the league as well, which is going to you know, impact lineups as you move down the stretch. Where we've got 25% of the season left, so depending on the team, there's anywhere between 20 to 25 games left in the season. And if you look at the standings, it's, it's a dogfight for us. We're looking at every game right now as a, as a playoff game moving forward. So that's our mentality. And, you know, knock on wood, we, we escaped without any major injuries from our players. Before I get to your view and your owner's view <laughs> on players playing in the Olympics, what about the legalities of injury? You say these guys are hurt. What? I assume the team pays their contracts. Mm -hmm. 
for the team flight path? All the players that participate in international tournaments, everything's sanctioned through the uh, IIHF, which is the International Ice Hockey Federation. That's the sanctioning body that oversees tournaments of the Olympics, the World Championships, which will happen in May. And, of course, other uh, tournaments throughout the year, which are at different levels, whether it's the under-20 or under-18 tournaments. Uh, these, those players, not so much. But when you get into the professional ranks, these contracts have insurance uh, in place before these players play in these tournaments. Uh, the New York Islanders case, um, the Detroit Red Wings, players that will miss games going down the stretch, uh, insurance will cover uh, their salary moving mm. forward. Uh, it's a little bit different than the disability insurance that we face in the regular season in the NHL, but it's uh, it, the players will be covered, covered insurance-wise, and the teams will get money back for that. And a guy, a, a, Tavares, losing a guy, is there any recourse? I mean, I'm just throwing it out. I just I can't even think of what that would be for the team that loses a player. John Tavares is... Uh, you could argue is probably one of the top five players yeah. in the National Hockey League, a tremendous young player who is by far the leader of that hockey team. And as, as the Islanders go, it's going to be a result of John Tavares, so it's a huge blow to them. Uh, again, they, they just have to rally around the fact he's not going to be in the lineup, and the players that are in the lineup are going to be the ones that are going to have to show up and, and give them a fighting chance to get back in the playoffs. Leads to the question. <laughs> Are you in favor of NHL players in the Olympics? From an entertainment standpoint, I, I enjoy watching the players in the playoffs, um, or in the in the tournament of the Olympics. It's it's a difficult um, topic because we shut down our league. Right. Unlike the NBA, which the players play in the off season, we're, we're shutting down our league. We we shut it down for two and a half weeks, where it's the prime time for sports entertainment in this country in terms of competition. Baseball is yet to start up. The NFL season is over. Uh, NBA actually takes a little break with their right. all-star game. So it's an ideal opportunity for us to come on, come on and, and, and you know, be a big factor in the sports scene. It's not NHL games, but as we said earlier, that U.S.-Russia game on a Saturday morning, nearly everybody was talking about it in the country. Uh, and everybody found out who T.J. Oshie was. Yes. <laughs> so uh, from those perspectives, yes, you like seeing hockey and the NHL players participating in the Olympic Games. Uh, but from the other side and the business side, the momentum side, I mean, we went into the Olympic break on a winning streak. Yeah. So, you know, there's a little bit on both sides there. You know, you, you want to, you know, continue what you're doing, build the momentum you're doing as a team, as a sport. But at the same time, uh, the rigors of, of a long National Hockey League season. Some guys really appreciate having a break this time of year, knowing that you're, you're hoping for a long playoff run as well. So, um, myself, from from an entertainment perspective, it, it's it's good hockey. It's fun to watch, and it's I'm in favor of you know seeing you know as we move forward. That's that's a debate for the media. I like it, but I also see the other side of you know we have a sport to promote and, and a game we want to keep playing. And, uh, you know, I think everybody here from our end is excited to get back to the National Hockey League, winding down the season, getting our playoffs started, because that is the best hockey. Yeah. And then finishing up the Olympics, your owner's been against it. And next Olympics, obviously, for those that don't know, is in, is in South, South Korea, Korea, which presents huge challenges. Uh, likelihood of seeing that again next Olympics? Again, I mean, it's a long way. It, it's right now. It's a debate strictly in the media uh, of whether we should go or, or will we go. Um, but it is a little bit away, uh, time-wise and also location-wise. Yeah. And you have to factor in, you know, logistics of travel and getting players over there and getting them back. I think something that with the Sochi Games was the host country is, uh, you know, hockey's as important there as it is. In Canada, you could argue. So it was a very important to, to a lot of players, especially the European players, to, to go and play over there in Sochi. And anytime you get to represent your country, any player who's participated in these tournaments and these events and the Olympic Games, it, it's it's a, quite an honor, no doubt yeah. about it. But you know, as I said, uh, you know, our focal point is hopefully nobody gets hurt. We were lucky from our end, and 
you know, moving forward, getting them back and getting that momentum and Stanley Cup playoffs. That's, that's what we're really focused, yeah. focusing on right now. What did, I th- this is an obvious question, what did the players do that weren't there? They were completely off? They had a 10-day um, period where the players had off. Uh, you know, no team events. We couldn't do anything with them promotional-wise, promotion-wise or practice-wise. Uh, they had to report back on the 19th of February, and we could begin our practices that afternoon. Um, it is almost like a mini training camp. Uh, hmm. For us, we only had five players at the Olympics. I say only because there were some teams that had eight, nine, ten players. Wow. Now that impacts practices, that impacts preparation. So you saw along the transactions of players being recalled from the minors just oh. so they could feel the practice. Huh. Uh, you know, we had our guys. Uh, uh, missing, but we still had 19, uh, 19, 18 guys here for practice. We were able to run some good sessions, and then the players who were eliminated early showed up on the weekend. So, oh, we had three days of practice. We gave them a day off. Uh, we practiced yesterday, today, tomorrow, and now you kind of get in the more of a feel of uh, getting ready for San Jose, the Rangers, and Washington. Our next three games. When so do you start up? Thursday night. Thursday night. So this week's more of a preparation for your opponents. Where last week you were kind of just you know, going through drill sessions of getting ready, get kind of like a mini training camp, getting the guys back into the group. And what was your office like these past three weeks, two weeks? Uh, a little bit quiet. Uh, you know, Did uh, guys get off? Or uh, the... Personally, I took a <laughs> long weekend. I uh, For the holiday weekend, uh, I, I took a couple days. Uh, and that's something you only get yeah. to do every four years in our business. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. outside of Christmas, it's, uh, it's a, you know, work, work, work in terms of our industry throughout the season, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, guys got out to see other games. Uh, the Phantoms actually played in Philadelphia, our minor league affiliates were able to see them come and play. So it, it was a chance for our guys to, to see some other games and get out and keep tabs on uh, other things going on in the hockey world. I'm going to move on to other subjects, but if anyone ha- we can always ask questions at the end, but any questions about the Olympic subject now, I'll take them now. And introduce yourself. Go ahead. That was uh, Coach Laviolette. He's a former coach, so he was uh, <laughs> he was let go the start of the year. Uh, but Peter was named to Team USA staff prior to. Uh, last off season as an assistant coach, uh, so he he was not there. Uh, you know, obviously our practices were run by our full coaching staff. We did have the situation in 2002 where Ken Hitchcock was a part of the coaching staff of Canada and was our head coach at the time. So he was, you know, uh, delegated some of the practices to uh, our assistant coaches. So, In terms of playing in them, or uh, no bonuses of, of that nature. All bonuses are, you know, directly related to the National Hockey League season. Uh, the insurance that's picked up for players that play in these international tournaments is all done through the Double IHF. So it's a different insurance um, arrangement than we have for the regular season in the NHL. Uh, but all players are covered, and that's kind of something that's negotiated prior to these tournaments happening, just in case there are injuries and, and players can be looked after and teams looked after as well, um, in case players miss time for what they're actually paid for, of course, which is the NHL games. Um, and then your other question was? Uh, in terms of the, the players going to the Olympics, that's something that actually gets negotiated. Um, and that was done by the National Hockey League, National Hockey League Players Association in the double IHF. Um, following the last lockout, they were able to come to an agreement of participating in the 2014 Olympics. And that's something that uh, all parties at hand will get involved with next and decide what's in the best interest of the game and, and moving forward.
I, I probably just heard the same as you, if not less, in terms of just what was in the on the internet that you know he was um, suspended from the game yesterday for because he tested for a banned substance. What it is, I'm not sure. What it's related to, there's all sorts of uh, rumors of what it could have been related to. So, uh, no, I haven't heard anything on that. Uh, they they have the uh, you know a set of uh, uh, banned substances that you know the players can get tested for at certain periods during the regular season. Um, so it's it runs a little bit different than you might see in an Olympic Games for sure. Hold on, Bianca, in the back. Doing an off-season tournament as opposed international on, on ice or. The, the World Cup hockey has been around in, in previous years. Uh, 1996 was the introduction of it, and it was kind of a, a, a format developed years ago by the Canada Cup, it was called. Uh, and 96 was the first year it came under the term World Cup of Hockey. And then again, we once we started taking part in the Olympic Games, I don't think it happened again until 2005. Um, and it hasn't been held since then, but that's an off-season tournament that is very popular, uh, has been successful. But again, that's something where you have representing co uh, countries. It's a it's a tournament that gets negotiated between the league, players' association, and then you know obviously the double IHF, uh, which sanctions all the international tournaments. They're the ones who also look after the World Championships, which happen every year right. uh, this spring as well. So uh, there's a lot of international hockey opportunities out there. Uh, the biggest thing for us is, you know, seeing where it all fits in. Uh, the World Championships has always been uh, a tournament that, you know, players have pride in. But, but obviously, their their goal is to win the Stanley Cup. So, uh, you may not see the best players in the world playing in that tournament just because they're probably still playing for their teams here in North America. Uh, once their team's eliminated or your team didn't qualify for the Stanley Cup playoffs, it's common for those countries to call and ask for players to. Come and play for them. Last year we didn't make the playoffs, so Claude Giroux and some of our other players uh, went and played for their countries at the World Championships. It was more uh, just a recall from to and from the minors. There was a trade freeze, uh, which happened. Uh, we have a similar one during the holiday season as well, uh, and I actually got lifted last night at midnight, so uh, <laughs> we're open for business, and uh, the trade deadline is next Wednesday at 3 p.m., so uh, you may hear some talk on the internet or in the papers over the next 10 days of what could happen and see where teams go. It, it's interesting that each year is always a lot of hype, a lot of talk that goes into the trade deadline, but you yeah. know, it, it's also, you got to do your homework. There's a lot of a lot of teams are lumped close together right now, and uh, under the CBA of 2006, when we came back, or 2005, when we came back to work, uh, the trade deadline moved from 21 days from the regular season end to 40 days. So you're measuring 40 days out now. Um, still, more teams are in the race as opposed to just three weeks left in the regular season. So um, that can dictate a little bit more of what happens on trade deadline, but. Uh, yeah, they did have a freeze just because there were some GMs that were taking part in the Olympics being uh, affiliated with their country's teams. Uh, so people were all over, and uh, uh, now we're back to business here. I want to pick up on the trade deadline question since you brought it up. Yep. We, uh, we just had the NBA trade deadline. It seems to me, and I'm, my expertise is more the NFL, where there aren't no hardly any trades at all. But it seems to me basketball trades are more about contracts than players, about moving cap room, getting expiring contracts, being able to maneuver after the guy's released, sometimes right away. Um, hockey trades, 
similar or are they more personnel oriented or are they more financial oriented like the NBA and your counterparts I, in I Philadelphia? Think, I, I, th <laughs> I think you always want to have a, a pulse on tomorrow you know, in terms of you know, you're planning for your roster and, and looking at things. Uh, but a, a majority of the deals that are made on the deadline or the days leading up are always geared towards players adding to teams this year that can help them get over the hump or put them in a position to win a championship. Um, so more like baseball. Yes. Last year you saw some you know, players get moved around that were you know, on expiring contracts usually. So players on teams that that may not make the playoffs get moved in in return teams will look for younger assets whether it's draft picks whether it's um, you know young players that might be playing in the minors or could be playing in college or junior hockey uh, it's usually a player traded for assets very seldom is it a, a a money for money deal unless there are two teams that are pressed up against the cap then you, right. you know you're trading well to make this work you're gonna have to take this guy back right. and vice versa the, oh, man. Yeah, the difference of us obviously is, you know, then you're talking of players that could have uh, different length of contracts uh, because ours are guaranteed. So right. if you're taking a player on, you're he's going to be under your reserve list for the next x amount of years, depending on the length of his contract. So I would imagine I we probably had similar roles when I was at the Packers. Trade deadline coming up, you're probably going through a lot of scenarios. If we move this guy, if we acquire this guy, if we move two guys, acquire three guys, you're working with the GM on that, I would Absolutely, think. yeah. yeah. You, you know, first of all, you, here's our cap space. This right. is what we currently have. And, you know, to take on this player, if we're looking at, you know, if we identify four or five players that could be uh, players we could acquire, you know, you look at where he fits into your team, obviously, from a personnel standpoint, but then you figure out from a cap also, you have to look at both sides now. How is he going to fit in with the cap? And then if there's a player, you know, that you're shuffling out in return from your current roster, it's a little bit easier. But if you're dealing with like teams did last year of prospects and draft picks, um, you're just taking on the space. So it becomes right. a little bit more challenging. Speaking of challenging, the the Kovalchuk mm -hmm. went to Russia. Yep. Does that worry you? More players going to the KHL? That possibility is there. Competition, you know, it's a professional league that um, is paying players at NHL level. Um, obviously, he was paid a lot of money by the New Jersey Devils, so yeah. I'm not necessarily sure it was money driven as it was um, going home. Possibly a chance to go home for him, um, but that that's always there. That's a you know threat when you're negotiating, especially with European players that you know, may have a tie to the country or to a city where one of those teams might be based. And it's not necessarily uh, the KHL. It, you sometimes deal with it with older players when there's a chance to go home and play, whether it's in Sweden, Finland, countries like that. But the KHL off obviously offers uh, a lot of money and gives players an opportunity to go over there and play. And, you know, our, our answer is always, it's not the NHL, though. <laughs> you know, right. this is the best league in the world. And uh, you play Have you had a, those discussions? We, Where you had to talk to an agent about competition overseas? We, we I, yeah, I've been in negotiations where an agent will mention, uh, you know, well, I know I can get this in the KHL. Well, <laughs> okay, this that's is what the we're KHL. and this is what we're prepared to offer, and you know, this is his, you know, possibilities here, you know, yeah. playing here and living in this country, and 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 you know, having an opportunity to play for the Stanley Cup, which is still, you know, the prize team trophy in all sports, we believe. Yeah. You mentioned the trade scenarios you're working on now. Can you give the students an idea of day-to-day -day operations in your job? Obviously now, trade deadline is sort of dominating things. And maybe different times of the year you have these flashpoints. But if you had to say sort of an average day priorities, the team is always, you know, you work closely with our GM and Paul Holmgren and, and, you know, team decisions are always the forefront and, you know, what makes Paul so, does his job so well, what makes him good at his job is he's always thinking about the team and, and you know, it, what we can do to be better. I yeah. mean, it, it's a tough league. It's it's hard to win games in our league and it's and it's hard to be competitive and, and get you want to get in the playoffs and have a good run. So, Working closely with Paul, it's it's team oriented. 
things, uh, you know, dealing with the roster. And again, when you get into the salary cap, any roster move now is implicated by salary cap. And obviously there's roster limits. You can only carry 23 active players. So, uh, you know, player gets hurt, you know, well, how long is he going to be out for? It is a minimum of seven days when you're putting him on injured reserve. So, you know, if you have two or three, if you think he's going to be out for two or three days, uh, that's fine. You'll go with your existing roster. If you want desperately want to get a player up from your minor league team, then you have to contemplate, you know, and find out, you know, how long is he going to be out? If he is going to be out for seven days, you put him, put the player on injured reserve, and then you can recall a player. So it's it, a lot of roster moves that, that play an effect on a daily basis, especially when you're playing three games a week, four games a week. And, you know, as we get down the stretch, I think we have 15 games in March, and uh, there's six games in April and 13 days. So it, wow. it's going to get tough as we go. Is he obviously your primary interface? Uh, Holmgren, other parts of the organization you deal with, you deal with business, marketing, PR, finance, obviously. Obviously the finance. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when you're paying the players the amounts of money we're paying them, we, we work closely with our finance department, and a lot of it's planning, a lot of it's budgeting um, to run the hockey department. It's not necessarily just the player salaries, but you have uh, player development, which is a big part of becoming a successful franchise. So, uh, you know, I work closely with uh, our director of hockey ops and, and assistant GM Ron Hextall in, in those uh, areas as well. So he oversees our minor league operations uh, and basically assists Paul and Ron and, and the business side is, you know, you're developing your budgets, you're working within your budgets. You, you know, they deal directly with the coaching staff of the two teams and the scouts mm -hmm. we have out in the field. And I'll talk to them uh, here and there, but they, they have the more direct contact with, with those uh, people on staff. But it, yeah, I would say on the other side of the uh, business side, uh, finance would be our ones we're probably speaking to on a daily basis. And I'm wondering, what I'm sure everyone here is wondering is <laughs> how'd you get in? And then how do they get in? <laughs> you know, that's it's always the question. Uh, what was your, what I like to ask people is sort of your inflection point where you went from this level to this level where you either got this job or got in a position where you could get a job like this. Um, it's always instructive to hear stories. I probably like all of you, you you, you know, you have an interest in sports and you have a desire to work in the business. Uh, I, I was just like you. I was an undergrad at Florida Southern College in this little part of Florida and uh, I was fortunate enough to get an internship with the Orlando Magic and it was their first season in the NBA. So it was uh, not only enjoyable from that standpoint because everything was new, everything yeah. was exciting, the building was filled every night. So I worked in as an internship, finished that up, graduated uh, that spring, and uh, wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I'm originally from the Boston area, so I was, do I go home or do I stay in Florida where I think sports, there was opportunity, sports, uh, uh, sports was growing at the time, so it was an opportunity for me to say, well, maybe there's more of a chance with change, you know, things that could happen here. Uh, so I decided to stay in Florida, and about two weeks later, I pick up a newspaper, and it's uh, Phil Esposito, Hockey Hall of Fame, is trying to bring a team to Tampa, Florida. So I get in touch with the people who, you know, were involved with Phil and, you know, volunteered about nine months of my time, you know, going from Orlando to Tampa to help them out with anything they needed from so were you in school now or are you out of school? I was out, but I was making photocopies. I was <laughs> helping them with press releases. I was, you know, you name it. I was just fresh out of college, but willing and able to get into the business. And uh, they were one of the teams that got an expansion team. And Phil hired me and worked my way up to Tampa and came here in 1997 with an opportunity with Bob Clark to work in the hockey wow. office. And he gave me a ton of opportunity, a ton of responsibility in terms of uh, uh, doing things within the hockey department. Especially from the business side, and then um, you know, got to work on contract research with him, and uh, worked on some arbitration cases, and that's when you know the idea of I always had in the back of my mind about going to law school, and um, that's when I you know one of the arbitration cases I worked on, you know, I asked him, I said, well, do you mind if I decide to look up, you know look into this a little further? And he was extremely supportive. The organization was supportive, and uh, I was able to go at night and still work during the day and made it happen. And opportunities since then have kind of 
all fell in line. A new CBA comes in, yeah. salary cap comes in, uh, different responsibilities within the hockey department. And uh, I just happened, you know, to be with a good organization that gave me the opportunity, and uh, you know, more than uh, thankful over the years from from everything from you know working for Mr. Snyder on the way down to Bob Clark to Paul Holmgren. So I've been very fortunate, but a lot of it has to do with being in the right place at the right time, and. Um, I think sacrifice has a lot to do with it. You know, it's difficult. You get out of school. You have bill. You know, bills. You have loans. You have things you have to pay for. Um, but juggling multiple, you know, ways to pay your bills to to get that volunteer time, you know, would be something I would recommend. And uh, whether it's internships or you know, paid or unpaid, uh, that that experience when you're young is extremely important. Not only from the experience standpoint, but Getting to meet people and getting to know people in the business as well. So it's, uh, it's uh, something that I would highly encourage that, you know, if you can make the internship situation work, uh, that's the route I would encourage. Questions? Yes. Oh, Adam's quite a fan. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his uh, names of the NHL young players for sure. It, it, you look at your team uh, in the off season. You look at opportunity that might be there for young players. You, competition's good in training camp. Um, you know, we have some young players. You mentioned time again. You mentioned Scott Lawton. Um, when we were sitting here, you know, after we drafted Sean Couturier, we weren't sure. You know whether he was going to make our team coming into training camp. But you always have a couple spots that, you know, you know you can fill with a player from the minors or one of the young kids coming up. And th those are always the interesting competitions that happen in training camp. Uh, 2011, we draft Sean Couturier eighth overall. And he comes into our training camp and plays, I think, six of the seven preseason games. And next thing you know, between the head coach, the general manager, who makes the ultimate decision, and, and the staff you know, decides to keep those players where there's a fit, where you're going to get ice time. The biggest thing is development. The last thing you want is a young player to come in and sit and not play because the places they could be playing at, they could be playing quality minutes in roles that they're going to be destined for later down the line. Uh, you mentioned Scott Lawton this year. That was our biggest decision was deciding, and even Sam Moran, they, defenseman we took last year, 18-year-old kid. He had an impressive rookie camp, and then he had an impressive you know, NHL camp when he played in some preseason games. But what's the best? At the end of the day, you do have to ask, what's the best for the development standpoint? And we've become a younger, younger league across the board. Uh, you're seeing younger stars in our game. But you can't forget what it takes to develop these guys in, you know, Spending time in the minors isn't necessarily a bad thing, or going back to junior isn't a bad thing. Now Sam Moran's going back and he's playing, you know, 30 minutes a night and for his team in the Quebec League. And Scott Lawton ended up being the captain of the World Junior Team and has been a, a big, strong player for Oshawa. And those are things that they may not have gotten had they stayed in the NHL. So a lot weighs into it. The one thing the players you did mention. They're all playing key roles for their team. They're playing to those forwards you mentioned are all playing top six minutes for their team. So uh, players to come in, if you have the opportunity, great. If, if not, it would really take a unique situation to make sure you're bringing the player along at the, at the right pace. Well, 
well, from our, our overall um, hockey operations, um, you obviously have the team. You have your budget for your players. You have your budget for operating your team. You know, obviously, there's a travel budget that falls in there. There's a, um, you know, where the team stays in hotels, all that, the, the charter plane, the transportation aspect, and then you get into the player development end. And, you know, we have an affiliation with a minor league team in the American Hockey League. And so you're paying the salaries of those players there. You're paying the coaching staff down there, the trainers there, the equipment for that team. Um, and so those are some of the things that, you know, I, you know, we just routinely stay in touch with on, on if it's not daily, it's at least a couple times a week with our finance department, it, more so than any other department. I probably have direct relationship with them. It is important. Yeah, it, it, because that's where, you know, we have a reserve list of 50 players we can have under contract. Hopefully you don't have too many injuries. So you have 23 on your NHL, and you could have another 24, 25 in your minor leagues. And they could, those are the players you negotiate those contracts. That's where you're developing. Those are, your, those are the players you're currently developing. You could have other prospects on your reserve list who are unsigned draft choices. Uh, and you know, the, the whole process is, you know, similar to football, but, you know, we actually have that development phase right. that football doesn't. So we'll draft the player, and instead of signing him and he makes the NFL team, our guys will, you know, if they don't make the NHL team, they're going down, they're playing in the American League, and for some players it even means the East Coast League, which is the equivalent of double-A baseball. They're all uh, uh, solid places for those players to develop their skills, and again, you go back to what's best for those players. Is it best for you know training and practicing uh, on a daily basis and getting into games where they can play on a regular basis and, and work on the areas they need to improve to get to the NHL? Uh, so yes, player development, and then also part of that is our scouting staff. They fall into the player uh, uh, development side because they're out looking at players, and we have scouts that range from the National Hockey League to the American League. So that's our pro side. We have players that will, scouts that will look at players that are all professional in North America. We have European scouts who do the same thing over there. And then we have our amateur scouts, which will scout between the uh, Canadian Junior Leagues, the U.S. Junior Leagues, high schools, colleges, uh, anywhere where there's players uh, that show potential to be drafted and have a chance to play in the NHL. We'll, we'll have a scout that will go and watch them. Uh, I would like to see it expanded a little bit. I, I understand why it's in place, and you know, I'm not sure with baseball. Is there a limit on what? Because it sounds like baseball, you know, you read the same teams develop the same amount of players, but is it because they can spend more on minor league development or uh, really more on facilities, facilities and more on opening up like international offices? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're we're still capped on what we can do in terms of uh, contracts you can have. So we're we're at the fifty. We may have another three or four that are on American League contracts, so they don't count against your NHL. Um, there's been a couple instances over the years where a player could be under contract and he stops playing for injury purposes. Uh, Ian LaPerriere, for instance, uh, uh, Mike Rathke, Keith Primo, those were players who, through concussions or yep. you know, uh, injuries that forced them to retire. But as long as they still had a contract and were being paid, they counted towards your 50. So that kind of you know, hmm. you know, uh, left you in a position where, oh, that's one less contract you're dealing with this year. Um, I always kind of threw it out there, you know, maybe the goalie shouldn't count. And I'm not saying you have 15 goalies under contract, but it's the it's the position that you really need the most time for developing purposes. Um, maybe they had 50 plus four or five extras, or, you know, where the goalie's probably six extras. So you could have two goalies in the East Coast League, two in the American League, and then two at the NHL, and give them the necessary time to develop those players. Yes.
with European players or? I think I think there's always lessons to be learned in our business, especially when you're dealing with young players. Um, you, sometimes there might be players that just might take a little longer to develop, and you know you look at how you might have handled them in, in the early years, and and you know maybe when did they turn pro? Did they turn pro too early, or you know the, everybody's different, so there's really no right time to find out when when a young player you encourage them to come out and sign, whether it's a college player or whether it's a junior player. Um, but I think it all depends on the individual situation that you could, you know, hopefully learn from and, and know that if there's a mistake you might have made along the way, uh, try not to do it again moving forward with a, with a similar player. I think so. I, yeah, what are, that's a great question. What are the tangible benefits of having the draft, having the Frozen Four? Well, from the Frozen Four, it's a chance, you know, obviously for us to showcase the rest of the country. This is a great hockey market, and, you know, the building will be filled. And um, you'll have the four best college teams fighting it out uh, for the NCAA championship. As far as our scouts go, um, you know, they'll get an opportunity to, you know, come and view the game in a similar uh, setting than they would, whether it was last year in Pittsburgh or the year before in Tampa, but uh, just knowing it's their own building, uh, yeah. a little bit more of a comfort level for their from their standpoint. What's but the dates on that? It's the uh, 10th and 12th, I believe it is, uh, second weekend in April. It's right after the uh, basketball, do you? So. That's great. And the draft date? The draft's here this year as well, which uh, you brought up another good point. Um, the NHL likes to travel with the yeah. draft, uh, which is fun for the fans, and it's fun to expose uh, uh, markets of the young players that are coming through our ranks and, and seeing them get drafted. And it's actually a, a great day for you know two groups: one, the scouts, because it's it's a culmination of all the hard work they put in for 12 months of the year. I mean, the, they'll be done with the draft in July is not a lot going on, but there's international tournaments and starting up in August where they're back at it. Uh, so for them, it's a big day for the scouts because they get to, you know, see where the players that they've ranked and rated fall in line. Um, the other is the families. Uh, if you get a chance to watch it or come down to it this year, you'll see the top hundred prospects there oh. and, you know, all their families will travel in with them and see their faces after, you know, just mentioned the hard work the scouts are putting in year after year. Uh, it's families that go through the sacrifice and the, you know, getting up, driving the kids to the rink early in the morning or going to these tournaments on weekends. It's, it's, a, it's a great day for them as well. So uh, it should be a fun event. You know, we'll, uh, uh, we'd love to have the 30th pick in the draft. That means we won the Stanley Cup. So, uh, yeah. Uh, we'll see how that all plays out this spring, but it's a it's a fun day. All the teams are on the floor, a lot of interaction, um, teams talking, GMs talking. The teams actually will come into town uh, as early as Wednesday, especially the teams from out west just for travel purposes, and uh, a lot goes on. There's a lot of talk. Uh, you'll see trades that happen that week, so it, it's, it's always a good thing, I think, for, for our business when all the teams are together, at least all the GMs are together. They do have their GM meetings several times a year, but it's a chance for the scouts to get in and interact in a more relaxed setting than being in uh, rinks across North America. I love it. I mean, I think the NFL should move the draft around. I mean, they've kind of resisted because New York's so cool for these yeah. kids to go spend a week in New York, but I think they should move it around. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, especially now it's in May and you can go to colder places yeah. like Chicago other climates for sure so you'll see the prospects around town that week they'll get yeah. in probably thursday we'll we'll do uh i think the phillies might be in town i'm not sure you'll see the the guys around at a phillies game possibly they'll they always showcase the top 10 so you'll see them going around they'll do a youth clinic probably and uh this is all driven by the nhl we're just here as the host uh, team and host venue and host city what's the date on that that is the last saturday friday saturday of june 
no. so they do Friday night is the first round on television, and then the next rounds go quick on the yeah. next day, <laughs> like the NFL. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm more so familiar with um, the NFL and what the NBA is, so just a very general question um, in the NBA industry. But um, in regards to the amount of violence, <laughs> um, what's your what's your opinion on the history of the Fortnite era? Do you think that it's too serious, or do you agree with something that is becoming so apparent in the game that it would really change the game? Do you mean the contact in the game? Fighting or yeah, fighting, the fighting or? the violence, the injuries, like it's it's pretty it's pretty intense. But it's 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 a it's a contact sport and it always yeah. has been. That's not going to change. I think that's what attracts a lot of people is the speed of these athletes now. Um, they haven't directly found a correlation of what's causing some injuries, but you do have to admit athletes are getting bigger and stronger, and the ice has stayed the same. So I, I've been to some NBA games and. And fortunate enough to sit down low, and they're getting bigger and stronger. Right. The athletes there, but the court doesn't change it. it it's the, the speed of the game is what has led to what fans enjoy, but it also can relate to some injuries here. Exactly. The fighting aspect that debate will go on uh, forever. It seems like in our sport, there's people who are for it, people are against it. Um, we don't want to see any player hurt in our game, whether it's in a fight or whether it's a collision through a, a, a legal check or or whatever it might be, but you know, as long as it's done in the right context, uh, you know, the, it's part of the sport and will, will remain there exactly. for yeah, a short time. Yeah, it has yeah. been there and it's been a part of the game. But um, yeah. also, um, you, you mentioned the more aggressive and how the players are more aggressive. And, um, I was just wondering if the relationship with Dirk Ben, which um, the amount of injuries that result from that sort of fight. We we haven't really had too many players injured from uh, fighting. Um, we had a player earlier this year get a concussion uh, from a fight. Uh, in, but if you're to amount uh, tally up the amount of fights that happen over the course of a season, and how many injuries come from fights, or how many injuries come from open ice hits, or um, I, th I think it, it'd be pretty low in terms of what's directly caused by a fight. I got to follow that up because we are in a law school. We got to talk about litigation. So I've been covering the uh, NFL concussion litigation, which is hopefully being settled. There's an NHL suit. Are you apprised of that regularly? Are you involved at all? Uh, is that a concern league wide? Um, that it may get to the point of the NFL where hundreds, if not thousands, of players join. I, th I think, you know, first of all, it's, it's, it's been a league matter, so it hasn't been a team matter. Um, but any time that there's players that are hurt for whatever reason may be, it, it's a concern for all of us. Uh, you obviously, um, you know, you want players to play and play at a high level and, and, and play with that intensity that, that makes sport so great, yeah. the competition of sport so great. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you want them to be able to walk away from the sport at the end and, and still, uh, you know, not feel any effects from any injuries or uh, things that could, you know, hurt them in a way of life. So right. that, that's more of a league issue now that they're dealing with, and, and uh, we haven't had any direct from the team perspective on that on the litigation. One or two more. It's it's been a, a you know a topic of discussion for years. I, you go back to you know, players playing you know, as early as some at 14 years old. You know uh, uh, have gone in and played at the at the OHL level. Um, I guess you could say from a chance to play in the NHL, uh, 
Um, the junior leagues has given the players the best opportunity to prepare them. Um, the length of schedule, the practices. Um, so players over the years have had other opportunities, whether it's to forego the OH, or not so necessarily the OHL, the Canadian Hockey League in general. Um, there's now the USHL. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's become more of a, a um, uh, step for players to go from the high school or, or their uh, you know, local um, programs into the USHL before they go to college. Uh, but, you know, we've seen players that have, you know, their dream is the NHL, and uh, the Canadian Hockey League's always offered them the best opportunity to get there based on the scheduling and the competition and level of play. Uh, but as you said, you know, if you do want to go to college and you want that, you do have to consider other options, whether it's uh, these junior leagues that, you know, are allowed by the NCAA to participate in, and then move forward, whether it's the USHL or the BC Junior League. And, uh, it may not be at the standard of the Canadian Major Junior League, but it's still pretty good hockey and it'll give you the opportunity to make that decision then whether you want to go on to the uh, collegiate ranks or not. I'm going to ask one more. I'm sorry. I said, I hope I that. answered that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's again, it goes back to what what the priority is of you know the, the goal of the player, and if you know he decides you know hey my goal is to be playing in the NHL when I'm 18 or 19 or 20 at the latest, then then going the Canadian Major Junior route would probably be his best shot. Uh, but you have to leave options open. That's where the advisors come in. It could be a topic of conversation uh, for the right. symposium yeah, later yeah, on. Is uh, you know. Where do you advise the young players to come in and play and uh, join a, a, a league at age 16 where they're moving away from their family, living with billets, and, and playing 70 games while still going to high school in the town that they're playing in and, and uh, making that decision at such a young age? It's difficult and it's challenging for the families, but again, it goes back to uh, what's best for the player and becoming a, a pro player. I'm going to ask one more question. I guess. Last night I was reading my ESPN, the magazine, analytics issue. So I know it's huge in the NBA. I know it's huge in baseball. I know it's not huge in the NFL, the old guard NFL. Where does it stand in hockey? Do you have a director of analytics? Do you have stat heads that come from statistical backgrounds working for you? Do you get involved in it? Uh, to answer all those, yes. <laughs> yes and yes. Um, we do uh, work with analytics. Um, we've, to an extent, stats have always been a part of our research and, and on a daily basis with our coaching staff. Um, but I think there's opportunity now to take analytics to a different level of uh, uh, not just your current team. You can use it with looking at, uh, uh, yeah, working with uh, some of the metrics to, to see the performance of players at lower levels. Huh not only for draft eligible, but potentially for uh, your players that are coming through your system now for player development. So uh, we do do we do we work with uh, um, an analytics group that assists us in this process now. Outsource group? Uh, yes, like, it's an outsource group. And they, they, um, they provide us with data uh, in all three areas, not just our big NHL team, but our minor league team, and then all, uh, for players that we're, we would look to do things with uh, uh, for potential draft purposes. And who directs them? Is that your role? Right now it falls yeah, to you on my desk. So that's something a little bit more that I've been doing this year on a daily <laughs> basis. <laughs> uh, but we hope to expand and, and you know we have somebody we'll bring on next year who's been doing some stuff for us this year and he'll kind of uh, work more directly with it. And, uh, it it's, it's a little more challenging. Uh, you know, you hear the, you hear the term analytics and everybody wants to think money ball and everybody wants to you know mirror what the success of, of what the Oakland A's started but 
in baseball, that one-on-one -on -one confrontation just isn't really there in hockey. It's we have too many moving parts. Right. You know, you have five players on the ice for each side at one time, right. where you can change on the fly. So, you know, if you're finding some information of what players might do uh, against a certain set of forwards, well, who is on defense? You know, yeah, there's so many. Why didn't measure that? Well, who, <laughs> you know, certain situations, you know. I imagine you figure out. Your best lineups is that, mm -hmm. or against this kind of defense, or? and and that's where the stats that yeah. we've always worked with over the years, some basic data uh, that we've kept internal through our coaching staff right. um, helps in matchups, and that, that's a big thing. Uh, yeah. One thing with our sport is the home team gets the last line change. So when you're at home, um, you know the, the stuff you may see on TV might be directed towards face-off data, but there's other other information our coaches are working with. Uh, that you know will want players up in certain matchups, certain periods yeah. of the game. So it's arrived. It's in our sport. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard of, not to. I mean, when yeah. you have that much information, the more the better. And uh, how you use it is up to you. And you know, if we can integrate it into our coaching, great. If we can integrate it into our uh, you know game preparation, that's good. Um, and then to do it at a lower level to help players develop. Uh, it's even better. It's here. You're right. I mean, I'm going to this conference next weekend in Boston. Yeah, which I'm sure a lot of hockey people will be yes. at. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's now become kind of the conference sports analytics. Yeah, it's a tremendous one. So. Anyone else? Let's give a warm appreciation to Barry. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And I will volunteer him to stay up here a couple minutes. Sure. And shake his hand. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Oh. Thanks. I'll be on hook here.